Good Monday morning. Welcome back to hashtag Zoo Open Online. We are here in the aquarium going to check out the jewel tanks. We'll give you guys a moment to come in and join us. We'll see who all's here today. Give a few shout outs and then as always get started with our morning announcements and then take your questions. I'm sure as you guys are looking here at the clownfish, you might have some Finding Nemo question related questions for us this morning and we're happy to see what you guys have to say. All right, good morning, Max. Hi, Theo, William, and Marcus. Thanks for tuning in, getting up early and tuning in with us today. Hi, Abby. Hi, Colton, Cassidy, Isabel, and Gracie. We are so glad to have you guys here in the aquarium with us this morning. Hey, Tucker in Livonia. Hi, Mom. Always got to get those in, right? Good morning, Mary Beth. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Andy and Ashton. Hi, Morgan and Bennett. Good morning, Kat in Toledo. She said she loves the aquarium. Yes. Izzy is celebrating her eighth birthday today. Happy birthday, Izzy. Thanks for tuning in this morning. We hope you have an awesome day. Hey, Connor. Hi, Lola and Rose in Michigan. Good morning, Nicole. Hi, Gavin and Grayson in Kansas City. And Melissa and Wasion, thanks for tuning in. Hi, Ruth and Napoleon. All right, guys, we are going to go ahead and get started in here this morning. We want to let you guys know, unfortunately, we do remain closed and we do not yet have a reopening date. But as soon as we know more, we will let you know on here, on our social and on our website. So stay tuned. We are just as anxious to get open as you guys are to come. So as soon as we know something, we will certainly let you all know and give you all the details. Until then, we are here doing these live feeds every weekday at 1030 a.m moving all around the zoo trying to show you guys what's still going on while we can't all be together and don't forget we are still doing our meals on the go so you need family for the whole or dinner for the whole family that's how it goes dinner for the whole family check out this week's options barbecue pulled pork sandwiches and beef or vegetarian stir fry don't forget we're always adding new desserts you can always get those cookie kits and cupcake kits we'll treat yourselves during this time a good idea. Those are all available at ToledoZoo.org slash Meals on the Go. And today starts our summer kids club with our education department. If you haven't had a chance to sign up, there's still time. Go to ToledoZoo.org slash kids club. And our education department is still doing all of their virtual classrooms and tours and animal training and horticulture tips and everything else. So check all those out at ToledoZoo.org slash virtual. And of course, we always have our donate button here. You guys mean so much to us when you come through the gates. You mean just as much when you're here with us this way. So if you are able, please consider a donation through our donate button on here or ToledoZoo.org slash donate for all the ways that you can help sustain your zoo during this time. All right, we are here in the aquarium, just kind of between the Pacific Reef Tank, the Touch Tank, and the Ocean Lab. And we are here with our aquarium curator, Jay, to talk to us all about these jewel tanks behind me. Jay, talk to us about this whole wall here. What do you want people to get out of this? So the jewel tank wall has a special purpose in that most of the animals exhibited here are too small to really fit into our main exhibits. The, you know, the old saying that big fish eat little fish. Well, we want to keep the little fish separate. Yes. And so we've got them in these little jewel tanks. But there's a second reason too. All the animals in these jewel exhibits have something unique or special about them that we want to highlight. And so there's the smaller size combined with the interesting behavior or uh, nature that they have lends themselves really well to these small exhibits. So, and the neat thing about small exhibits is that we can change them too over time. So right now we're looking at a section called man-made marvels. And these are fish that you might have in your own home aquarium. Goldfish and tetras that all have been either genetically modified by selective breeding or by uh, uh, other means to look different than what they did when they were in the wild. And so what we're showing here is 
we have photographs above the exhibits of what the natural fish looks like. And then on exhibit, we have the fancy version that you might find in your local pet store. And we talk about the differences and, and ask people, you know, which do you like? Do you like the natural version or the enhanced version? And there's, it's kind of split. But okay. a year from now, we can change that into another topic. In fact, previously, that used to be deadly beauties. It was five different chambers of animals that were very pretty, but also very venomous. Ooh. Scorpion fish, things like that. So we did that for three and a half years, and now we've changed to this. And in the future, we can change to something else. So that, that changeability is really important because then there can be different things when the visitors come to the zoo and, and see things. Absolutely, and why, do they, why are they called jewel tanks? Um, I think primarily because they're small and, and delicate and typically pretty colorful. Um, although seahorses are not, seahorses over, over here, they're not colorful, but they have some amazing adaptations. And, and they don't live well with other fish. They are so slow and unassuming um, that other fish would outcompete them for food. And so we keep seahorses in a tank by themselves. Talk to us about seahorses. You said they're amazing creatures. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about them. Well, they have a head shaped like a horse. They have a pouch like a kangaroo. I'll talk about that in a second. They have a tail like a monkey. <laughs> and their eyes can rotate independently like a chameleon lizards oh, do. that's so cool. Um, so their pouch. That's a male pot-bellied seahorse right there. That yellowish area on its belly is a pouch. And what happens is the female will lay eggs into the pouch. The pouch then incubates the eggs. And the male then basically gives birth to live baby seahorses. Oh, that's so cool. And how many, we just have the one? We just have two males right now. Okay. One in the front on that plant and then one in the back. All right, very cool. And then as we move down from seahorses, if we're, we're moving here from right to left, mm -hmm. uh, down here is our clownfish? That's right, clownfish and sea anemones. So you might see a, a similarity there with finding Nemo. This is the same species of clownfish, although ours um, have uh, different color patterns than Nemo might have. We built this exhibit low to the ground. I, I'd say it's only about 20 inches off the ground. Yes. And that's for the younger set to be able to walk right up and put their face right up to, to Nemo. <laughs> and we've seen a lot of them lot do of that, that, haven't yep. we? <laughs> um, makes it a little hard for older people like me. We've got to crouch down to get a good view, but <laughs> it's all about the kids and, and letting them see this unusual behavior. So sea anemones, have stinging cells in their tentacles and they can sting other fish to keep away predators that might otherwise try to eat the sea anemone. Clownfish have taken advantage of that. Um, they're able to actually live amongst the tentacles without being stung and uh, gain protection from predators that way. That is so cool. And as you said, a sea anemone is a living thing. That's right. They're related to jellyfish and coral. Cool, and it's a beautiful color. And, and when you look at that sea anemone, how many do you think you're looking at right now? Guys, how many do you yeah. think we're looking at? How many sea anemones do you think are in this tank? Let's see here, we'll, we'll give everybody a couple seconds here to, to take a guess of how many sea anemones you guys think are in this tank with our clownfish. All right, we're not, Tony guesses 10. Very good, Tony. Um, <laughs> I think I think just standing here, I counted probably 15. Oh my gosh. They, they inflate and all their tentacles sort of run together. And in the center there, it looks like one big anemone, but there's around the edges you can see, especially to the right lower edge, you can see there's a distinct single anemone right there by itself. Its tentacles have pulled back a little bit so you can see that it's not connected to the other ones. Okay. All right, and Ainsley would like to know, what do you feed the clownfish and the anemones in this tank? Okay, well clownfish, you know, clownfish can be actually kept in home aquariums if you have a properly operating saltwater aquarium. And they just are fed uh, brine shrimp, flake food, and small krill, which are little tiny shrimp-like organisms. Okay. The interesting thing about the sea anemone is the color that you see, that brown coloration, is actually due to algae, a photosynthetic organism that lives in the sea anemone. Under light, that photosynthetic algae produces simple sugar. Mm. And sugar is an energy source right. of food. So the sea anemone gets a lot of its energy, food energy, from the algae. In captivity, 
you'll see the clownfish will actually feed the anemone. They'll take big pieces of food and take it over to the anemone and feed it. Oh, how cool. Which is really cool, except that it's never been really documented that they do that in the wild. Ah. Um, and we think they do it in captivity just as a way to sort of stash their food. <laughs> they get a little <laughs> a extra little food. Hoarding, so it's a little hoarding for the <laughs> clownfish, not so much being nice to the anemone, but it's kind of neat. Um, and then we feed the anemones then chunks of shrimp and smelt a couple times a week. Very cool. All right, let's keep going over to our left here. Let's, we'll stay down on the lower tank. These look like snakes, but they're yeah, not, right? They're not. They're called <laughs> garden eels. And you say, garden? What's that all about? Well, think about if you were scuba diving and you saw 500 of those coming up out of the sand. It looks just like a garden of, of, of plants. Oh, I bet. Um, and they're basically, they're about 12 to 18 inches long. So most of their body is burrowed down in the sand. And it's a protection against predators. Mm -hmm. If you were to see them in the ocean. These animals have become very uh, uh, comfortable with people being right up next to the glass, so they just hang out. But in the wild, if you got within 10 feet of them, they'd slowly retreat down into the sand and you can't see them. Oh my gosh. And um, what, the little white specks that you might be able to see floating through the water there, mm -hmm. that's brine shrimp. And we just put that in the tank to feed them for their morning feed. Okay. And that's why some of them are a little more active right now, maybe? Right. All right. And then there's two other little fish in there called yes. shrimp fish, and they're in the back right corner. They also call them razor fish. They're very thin. They almost look like feathers floating in there. Uh-huh. The and they have a protection against predators. There's a type of plant called turtle grass that grows at the bottom of the tropical areas in the ocean, shallow areas. And these shrimp fish will hang head down in the fronds of turtle grass and you really can't see them. Oh my gosh. Um, and so that's a protection against predators as well. Those are really cool. I had not seen those before. <laughs> Very cool. All right, now above this tank are these man-made marvels. Talk to us about the variety of species that we have here. Well, it changes from time to time. There's four different tanks here. They all share the same water, but the fish can't go from one tank to another. And that's just to make sure that if we have some that aren't compatible, that they don't get mixed in with incompatible fish. So what we've done here, right there, those are fancy goldfish, including the, the bubble eye goldfish that has those almost grotesque looking <laughs> eye bubbles, but they're bred to look that way through what's called selective breeding. So over hundreds and hundreds of years, people uh, have bred goldfish to have different fin shapes, different colors, and as each, uh, as each uh, different trait is uh, brought out, then, then they, can, they can sort of focus on that and you can actually enhance the fish. Now, some people say that those are ugly. Um, they're, they're gross looking because they don't look like a normal goldfish. But you have to understand a normal goldfish is just olive green with short fins. It looks like a carp. Um, a tiny one. What's that? A tiny A small one. carp, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a tinier one. And so we have different ideas. There's a picture right there of what a natural goldfish looks like. So starting with that fish, they've produced, through selective breeding, all these other varieties. I, I, I'm kind of a purist. I like to see animals the way they would look in nature. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can understand the, the, the interest that people have with these enhanced beauties. There is one type of enhanced fish that we don't have here and we don't approve of. They actually will take fish and paint them with iridescent dye. Ooh. Um, not only is it temporary, but it's wholly artificial and it's not good for the fish. So we don't support anything like that. We, I'm also kind of opposed to uh, crossbreeding, where you take two different, completely different species and, and get offspring from them and they grow up into something weird. And I'm, we're also not into that. We're into the, to the idea where science and good animal husbandry can actually change the way the animal looks. This is no different than your, if you have a purebred dog or any do mixed dog at home, mm -hmm. they all have different traits. Some have long ears, some have short ears, some are big, some are small, it's the same thing. Yeah. So this is kind of like the domestic fish area. <laughs> and like I said, in a year, we can change it to another topic very easily. And uh, right now it's, it's uh, man-made marvels. So Sean asks, 
what's the difference between hybridization, which you were just talking mm -hmm. about, and genetic modification, which is shown here? Okay, so hybridization would be mixing of two different species um, genetically. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good hybrid that I know something about. Um, so I'm trying to think of a, a good example. Wolves, wolves and dogs can be hybridized. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They don't make good pets, so I wouldn't recommend that, but it can be done. They're close enough related. Yes. Selective breeding is you breed two fish of the same species, but then the babies, some of the babies look a little different. There's always a little variation. So one might have a little bit brighter red color than the other one. So then you take those that are brighter red and you breed those with other ones that are brighter red and you continue to do that generation after generation and then you can develop using two fish that were the same species to begin with something that looks totally different. And that's how, that's how purebred dogs are developed. Very cool. All right. Um, and Allison wants to know, can goldfish be an invasive species? Yes. Um, I see a lot of goldfish out in Lake Erie, in fact. Um, what's interesting is, given time, they will revert to that natural olive green color. Hmm. So I've seen bright gold goldfish out in Lake Erie, but now you, a lot of them now are changing back to the green. And you might say, well, why, why? If they started off gold, why come they're going back to green? Well, something called selective pressure. All the fish-eating birds out in Lake Erie can see those can gold see fish gold, right? miles away <laughs> and will come in and try to eat them. The olive green ones, there's an advantage to being olive green, obviously, you, sure. you blend in. So, but yes, they can be an invasive species. Interesting. All right, and then let's make our way towards this last one here on the wall. What do we have here, Jay? Well, this is just what a home aquarium could look like. Um, these are fishes from South America, but the one thing that we're doing in here that is a little different is that we have lots of live plants. Live plants are hard for public aquariums like us to grow. A lot of fish eat plants. They also need a lot of light and special care. It's really difficult to do live plants in a huge aquarium, but it's, it's doable in something like this, which is about 200, 250 gallons. I was just gonna ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got little tetras. They're the little orange and silver fish. Also, we have uh, neon, neon and cardinal tetras. They're the ones with the long red stripe and the blue. And then we have the discus. And they're the blue cichlid fish there. There's also some little catfish in there. And if, you, if it wasn't for the plants, you'd see there's actually quite a few more catfish in there than you can see at any one time. They hide down in the plants. <laughs> and what type of plants do you have in there? Oh, good question. Um, I have a hard time pronouncing some of the plant names because I don't work with them, but there's a Nubius over on the right, and then the, the tall ones are called Valisneria, and then at the bottom are some things called Cryptocrines. And we we grow them here. In fact, they grow so well, we have to trim them back and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of depopulate the tank. We'll make sure there's enough room for the fish to swim. That's a good problem to have, though, right? <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and you mentioned this tank has about 250 gallons of water. How about some of these others? How much do they have? Oh, you know, I think the the jewel tank um, is about 120, about 150 for the garden eels, same for the clownfish, and maybe 80 for the uh, the seahorses. We've got a really cool database that we know the exact volume of all these tanks, so I don't have to memorize it. Um, <laughs> cool. And that's used useful in case we ever have to put medicine in the water so we know exactly how much medicine to put in. And do you, these all maintain at a certain temperature? Each one of these is slightly different. So the discus here would be warmer. Uh, the seahorses are actually a cool water species and they're kept below uh, 68 degrees. Um, and the other ones are tropical. So, and, and some are fresh water and some are salt water. That was gonna be the next so question. So the, uh, the South American plant exhibit, that's fresh water man-made marvels as freshwater, but the garden eels and of course the clownfish and anemones are, are marine as are the seahorses. So we have uh, salt water that we make up in our basement from synthetic sea salt that we mix with a proper amount of Toledo City water and that makes seawater and that's for those animals and then the fresh water we get just from Toledo City as well. All right and Sue asks 
For the sea anemone, mm -hmm. can the entire length of the tentacle sting? Um, I'm thinking, because my first answer is yes. <laughs> but then you always have to think it through and make sure that you're not missing something. Um, not all anemones uh, sting throughout their entire tentacle, but this, this species does. This is, called a, this is called a bubble tip anemone. Um, in the wild, the ends of the tentacles get these little round bubbles on them. Uh, here, <laughs> the name doesn't make much sense because the tentacles are straight. <laughs> but they can uh, develop those little bubbles in the wild. Um, and those have stinging cells all the way down um, the, the base of the anemone where the uh, digestive organs and everything are typically do not have stinging cells. All right. And before we wrap things up here, talk to us about this tank behind you too so that people don't, uh, don't miss this when, you're, when oh, okay. you come to see the jewel tank. We don't want you to get too distracted right. by the touch tank and everything else. Make sure you're appreciating everything. Talk to us about this one. Well, this is a schooling fishes exhibit. And, you know, schooling behavior is when fish all swim together as a group. And that's actually a protection against predators as well. Um, a predator would come by and have a difficult time singling out an individual to go after, and the whole school can get away. Um, there is some, just for... The, <laughs> The fish nerds out there, there is two different terms actually. Schooling and something called shoaling. Okay. Schooling are a group of fish of the same species going somewhere. Got it. Shoaling are a group of fish, could be different species, but a group of fish sort of hanging out together, not really going anywhere. Okay. So these look like they're going somewhere, but they're really not. They're just going in circles. So I would call this a shoal. And these are barred flag tails. They have the little white and black bars on their tails, kind of neat looking. Um, and they're, they're young, and they were raised in captivity in uh, uh, central, the Central Pacific area. And uh, we've had them here now for almost a year. And uh, they, uh, they just swim around and around and, and uh, do quite well in there. And talk to us about how big they are, because you've mentioned before that mm -hmm. us viewing them through water distorts the size that they actually are. Tell us a little about that. Well, you can try this yourself. Take a glass of water and uh, take a, a pencil or a straw and put it into the water and look at it from the side. If you look carefully, you'll see two things. Number one is that the uh, pencil will look split right at the water line, like part of it's to the left and part of it's to the right. Mm -hmm. If you look really close, that pencil will be actually larger, about 30% larger underwater than it will be above water. It didn't get bigger, it's just magnified. And water magnifies, so by about a third. And it brings things about a third closer to you. So it's kind of funny though, because it's the human eye, and I've worked around fish all my life. I can't explain it. I don't see the magnification anymore. Um, other people though, if you were to catch one of these fish out and hold it in a net, it would immediately look 30% smaller in the air. My eyes somehow adjust to it because I need to know exactly how big the fish is. Um, it's kind of an optical illusion sort of thing that I've learned to overcome. So that's what happens with magnification. Also this being a round tank, there's a little bit of distortion as they swim around and the magnification can actually be enhanced as they come around the curve and the fish look really big and stretched out. And then when they're right in front of you, they, they're only a third bigger than they would normally be. So how big would you say those are? They're about like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't have a tape measure with me, so three two, inches. Two, three inches, yep. yeah, all right. That is so cool. Did you wanna go behind the scenes real quick? Yes. Let's take a look. So we have the jewel exhibits here with a nice decorated exhibits and the front looking into the exhibits, but then to keep all the animals alive, we have all this equipment behind the scenes. And this is what the keepers would see. This is their angle right. and their view and where they're usually working. Yep, this is where we would work. This is where we feed the fish. I'm not gonna go through all the equipment. There's a lot of it here. <laughs> I know it can be confusing, but um, a lot of the same equipment would be if you had a home aquarium. That is very so like, for neat. instance, this is the clownfish and anemone tank. Mm -hmm. And this is an LED light. And it doesn't look like much, but if you put your hand under there, you can see how bright that is. Oh, yes. That is cool. And this, guys, is what he was saying, you know, keeping all of them at different temperatures, fresh water versus salt water, how many different gallons, keeping water moving. All of these things are 
what his aquarium staff is trained to to do each day and you know to best care for these animals so we did just want to give you guys a little sneak peek behind the scenes here at what goes on and all the care that goes into these fish so jay how many fish would you say are in the aquarium well we have a computer database for that <laughs> gives us exact numbers we reconcile those numbers once twice a year actually to make sure the counts are accurate I hesitate because we also have a huge aquarium over in the Malawi Event Center yes. that has about 4,000 fish in it. Wow. So anytime I add up how many fish we have at the zoo, I've got to make sure that I either add those into the number, if I'm talk talking about the whole zoo, or subtract them. So I would say in this building right now, we have approximately, um, approximately 3,000 fish in this building, maybe 2,800. And number of species could be oh, about 300, including invertebrates too, about sure. 300. All right. All right, guys, we have two more questions for you, Jay. Mm -hmm. The first one is from Allison, and she wants to know what is the best sustainable home aquarium pet option? Hmm. That's a, there's a lot to that question. <laughs> that is. Uh, best sustainable home aquarium. I would say... Overall, I would go, depends on your experience level, I would go with a tropical freshwater aquarium and, and use uh, fish that have been raised in captivity. Um, down in the fish farms in Florida, for instance, or in Southeast Asia. So that means they aren't wild caught, they didn't come from the wild. That means they're hardy because they're freshwater. De marine fish, saltwater fish can be a little more delicate. Um, and so they're perfectly sustainable because they were bred in captivity specifically to be put in home aquariums. And can you give us an example of maybe a, a good starter fish if you're just getting into mm -hmm. a home aquarium? Um, platies, quarry catfish, sword tails. Um, those are all pretty generally hardy. Okay. Um, and they're colorful and interesting. Yeah. Very cool. All right. And Liam wants to know, what is your favorite fish here at the zoo? <laughs> well, I get that question. Um, I, I think I have one favorite group, and that's the flashlight fish. Yes. They're the ones in the dark room with uh, the glowing bacteria underneath their eyes that mm -hmm. flash and light up. We've had them here at the Toledo Zoo Aquarium since I've been here. Um, and, and we've done research on them, um, studied them quite extensively. Um, and we're in fact known for flashlight fish around the world actually. So that's my ultimate favorite. But the other answer would be whatever new fish I happen to be working with that <laughs> week or month, you know, those are my favorite. The ones I'm focusing on, trying to learn how to care for them properly and making sure that, that we have a great place to exhibit them. And so that's my current favorite is anything like that. Um, it, it changes. I love it. And Ashton wants to know What's your favorite part of your job? Well, you know, when I started working in aquariums, it was feeding the fish. Um, that was my favorite. But as a curator, I really don't feed the fish anymore. And it took me a long time to understand um, because as a curator, I don't work directly with the animals, which was what I really liked to do. But now I find that I can work with the animals indirectly through my staff. And so actually managing people has become the big part of my job. And I've learned that it can be very fulfilling as well. Even though I'm not working directly with animals, I see my staff that gets to work directly with animals and I can help manage and make sure the animals are getting the right kind of care. And I can see their challenges and their excitement when we get new animals in. And so I can sort of live secondarily like that. Yeah, you get to share in their successes and mm -hmm. also help them out along the way. Yep. That is very cool. All right, guys, we are going to uh, wrap up here for today. As we have said, though, you know, we do not know yet when we're going to get to reopen. As soon as we do, we will let you guys know on here, on our social, and on our webpage. Please stay tuned. Hang in there with us. As I've said, we are just as anxious to 
get you guys back here as you are all to come. So as soon as we know something more, we will certainly let you know. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks, Jay, for all of this amazing information. And guys, don't forget, when you can come back to the zoo and you come in the aquarium, be sure you stop at the jewel tanks. Now you know a little bit more about them. Thanks for joining us all. We'll see you tomorrow.